Greetings A Push Scholars from 3rd and 7th period uh, AP US history. Uh, looking at the review sheet from top to bottom, some thoughts on our review here for the test coming up. You should be familiar with the Mississippian cultures and their mound building. And they're in the Mississippi Basin area, covering quite a, a large expanse. The most famous of these groups, the um, community at Cahokia, this huge 100-foot high ceremonial mound found across from St. Uh, Louis. You have the Anasazis, who are the Pueblo Indians, perhaps better known as the Pueblo, named by the Spanish because they looked like they lived in towns. They had these uh, cliff dwellings in the southwest, and they're famous for irrigating the desert. They engineered their um, arid land so that they could grow in an area where there wasn't a lot of rain. You have the Iroquois, this famous confederation, this very strong military alliance of five and later six tribes in what is today central and upstate New York. And in the 1770s, sort of sadly, they their alliance falls apart as they divide during the American Revolution, whether they should support the English or the Americans. But the Iroquois are famous for their women elected their tribal leaders. They had matrilineal descent, um, and they uh, women could divorce, with the mother keeping the kids. So you had this, this very egalitarian society, which did include women as being essentially, you know, in no way subjugated by men. And their confederation is an example of uh, representative democracy. And some people think that um, the, the alliance that Benjamin Franklin was proposing in the Albany Congress during the French and Indian War was uh, perhaps modeled on the Iroquois. The Iroquois lived in longhouses, which are sort of symbolic of this communal uh, living. The relationship with the Indians, uh, the Spanish largely incorporated the uh, Indians into their society. They intermarried. You have this new race, the Mestizos. The Spanish set up missions to teach European ways, farming and animal husbandry and uh, European skills, things like carpentry. The French and the Dutch were more likely to see the Indians as uh, allies or aids in hunting down animal pelts such as the beaver. There weren't as many of them, and they, um, they worked with the Indians. Both the Spanish and the French did send Catholic missionaries to convert them. The Dutch weren't so interested in this. The Dutch, being um, good Calvinists, had more of a distinction between um, those who were elect, those who were Christian, and those who weren't, as the English. The English settlements weren't so interested in um, in intermarriage or in conversion. This did not happen very much at all. And the English came in much greater numbers. And when uh, the, um, the English fought a number of wars here, you've got the Powhatan Wars in Virginia, you've got the Pequot and King Philip's War up in New England, basically taking Indian land and sort of kicking them uh, far and apart from the Europeans there, the English Europeans. The Columbian Exchange, what was it? It's this exchange of flora and fauna, including diseases, uh, plants and animals. And the impact on Europe is huge. These new crops, in particular potatoes and corn, potatoes can be grown in sort of, uh, sort of meager soil. So Scandinavia in particular and Ireland, you have the potato as a crop and corn. Um, it you know spreads throughout Europe. And what this creates is more more calories, and there's a, a population explosion in Europe after the discovery of the Americas. In the United States, first of all, diseases within about 100 years, 90-95% of the Indians die because of diseases, but there's also this import of uh, wheat, barley, millet, oats, these European crops, and large animals. There you have horses, you have cows, you have pigs, you have sheep. And uh, these are going to uh, spread far and wide in America. Think of the Longhorns in, the, in uh, Texas. They're descended from runaway um, cows from the Spanish. The Three Sisters are these crops of corn, squash, and beans. And the importance is uh, you should know that most North American Indians were farmers. Maybe some of them had a semi-nomadic existence where in the winter the men would hunt. But almost all of North American Indians did farm corn. And... Um, 
by planting beans with corn, this allowed sort of the natural replenishment of the soil. Beans are legumes, and legumes fix nitrogen back into the soil, so they didn't have to rotate their fields like the Europeans were doing at the time. And the Indians, when they're discovered, this discovered quote unquote by the Europeans, are living very healthy. They've got these high protein, um, you know, fish and and, and uh, deer available as well as corn, bean and squash, which is, is giving them their staple diet. Spanish exploration and settlement, you should just be familiar with the area. We're talking about the southern part of what would be the current United States, in particular the southwest, where there are a lot of missions, places like California, New Mexico, Texas, and, um, and Florida. Similarities and differences in colonization between Spain and England. Well, the Spanish, unlike the English, intermarry. The Spanish set up this encomienda system. The idea is, in return for being civilized and Christianized, the Indians are going to provide labor. And basically, this is a version of slavery. The English uh, do enslave the Indians uh, as well, but the English aren't living among the Indians, and the English aren't intermarrying, and the, the English are really failing in any serious effort at conversion. But both the Spanish and the English inadvertently spread disease, which wipe out which, which wipe out these these um, various tribes. Differences between Virginia and the Chesapeake colonies are Virginia, or what is also called the, the Chesapeake colonies, that would include Maryland and Massachusetts. Virginia, remember, is founded by these gentlemen who are looking for wealth. They're looking for gold and silver. And this is a, um, a joint stock company which is being funded by investors, and they're looking to follow the example of the Spanish who've stumbled across you know, huge amounts of gold in their conquest of the Aztecs and the Incas, and they don't find it. And the Virginia colony is saved at sort of the last moment by the planting of uh, West Indian sweet tobacco. And you end up with this plantation system where in 1619 you have the first slaves are brought over on a Dutch ship and slavery very quickly goes from being um, a type of indenture to being a permanent racial fixture. If you're black, you're racially inferior and you're a slave. So you have the growing of cash export crops such as tobacco and indigo and farther south um, rice. Virginia has an established church. You have the Church of England, but you have relative religious freedom. In Massachusetts, uh, you have the Pilgrims followed by the Puritans, really the same group theologically in most ways. The Puritan colony will swallow up the Plymouth colony of the Pilgrims, and they're looking for religious freedom from the Church of England. Note, they're not looking to extend religious freedom to others. You have smaller farms. You don't have this huge export uh, plantation economy. There is slavery, but not as much of it. It's more likely to be urban. Um, and again, smaller farms here. Uh, both Virginia and Massachusetts become dependent on overseas trade. And think of the, triangle, um, the triangular trade, which is taking slaves from Africa on English ships, dropping them off mostly in the Caribbean, but also in the southern part of what are the American, the English American colonies. And then you have uh, molasses and you have sugar being brought up to England to be made into rum to be shipped back to Africa. Both the Virginians and the Massachusetts will clash with the Indians as they're expanding onto the frontier. Both Massachusetts and Virginia have a type of a democratic government. You have the House of Burgesses, which is the um, sort of the, the land-owning aristocracy, choosing from among themselves um, who will govern. In Massachusetts, you have the town meeting hall, which represents the, uh, the freemen of small towns. And then you have the Massachusetts um, the General Court, which is the name of their um, uh, sort of part-time legislature. Again, a representative legislature of free, free white men. In Virginia, um, be familiar again, tobacco is the crop that um, basically the Europeans can't get enough of, which is going to propel the spread of, of um, plantations away from the coast. Um, slavery in the House of Burgesses, both are being established in 1619, an interesting contradiction here in American history. The term republicanism refers to this idea of self-government without a king. 
and changes in slavery in the first decades. Again, the early slaves in Virginia were, were seen as indentures. They're sort of a, a, a temporary um, condition, but very quickly here, we're talking just really within a decade or so, slavery becomes permanent, becomes racial, whereas indentures were you know, virtually a type of slave for seven years. You um, have your way paid over and you're working hard. You're working on somebody's farm and they can pretty much starve you, beat you, you know, women are abused. It's, you don't have any rights, there's zero, but after seven years, you're getting your freedom. And this is not true from the blacks that are bought, um, brought over in increasing numbers here. Um, big change after 1676. Think of sort of 1676. This is 100 years before 1776, which is a key date in American history, of course. But 1676, you have Bacon's Rebellion. And this is a rebellion on the frontier in Virginia. And it is largely led, well, it's led by Nathaniel Bacon, who is not a uh, you know a poor farmer, but he's leading a bunch of freed indentures who are mad. They're mad. They're they're being forced to um, inferior land. They're having clashes with the Indians, who and they're being sort of disregarded and ignored by the Jamestown government because the Jamestown government is getting a cut on this fur trade. So they're not anxious to really you know to to um, do anything that makes the Indians mad on the frontier. Plus, they're being taxed and they're not being represented because again they're not they're not landowners. Um, as such. And what's going to happen is after Bacon's Rebellion, the use of indentures will decrease and the use of slaves who are more docile or who can be, um, you know, who aren't going to be these uh, loose cannons, the uh, slavery will displace indentures as the basis of, of agriculture in Virginia. The Middle Passage refers to the um, movement of slaves from Africa to the New World. Conflicts with the Indians, who fought, why, where, and the outcomes. The Pueblo Revolt, remember 1680, you have Pope leads the Pueblos in a revolt against the Spanish. They're tired of the denigration and the sort of the um, you know, being forced to live on these encomiendas and, and um, forced to convert and follow Spanish ways. And they burn down. They burn down the, the the Spanish churches and towns and the Spanish flee. And for 50 years, the Indians get away with it before they are reconquered. The Powhatan Massacre and War. There's actually three wars. Um, sometimes it's just referred to as the Powhatan War. 1622 is this time of this huge massacre. About a third of the Virginians are killed here. And this clash lasts for a while, but the Indians ultimately are the losers here. The Pequot War in 1636 is farther north. It's not in Virginia, but in Massachusetts. And again, this is over basically land grabs of the ever-expanding uh, Puritan New England settlers. King Philip's War, 1675 to 78. This is a war that sees a massive Indian attack in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Maine. And the ultimate outcome is the loss by the, by the Indians. But at the time, 10% of the New England uh, men who are soldiers are, are killed. There's 1,200 homes that are burned. About 20 towns are, are destroyed. And this is per capita the, the most violent war in, in American history. And uh, the Indians, you know, they have a temp temporary, they set the colonists back on their heels, but they do lose. Massachusetts, some thoughts on society, politics, education and religion. The center of Massachusetts society is the church, is, is a society based upon the scriptures. And the church's job is to teach the Bible, to teach the scriptures, to have a society patterned on obedience to those scriptures. You have schools set up to teach the Bible. You have the old deluder act, which refers to this idea that Satan is a liar. He's a deluder. We need to teach children to read the scriptures, be familiar with them. Politically, you have these town meetings, the town hall, the town meeting center, often the church is where men would go to meet for, um, to, for votes on things that <clears throat> um, were concerns of, of the town. Um, again, you had no tolerance of other religions. In New England, you are in Massachusetts specifically, you had the driving out of the Quakers, um, you have the famous driving out of Roger Williams, who's um, basically a Baptist, and they're looking for freedom to follow their own beliefs. And this idea that God will not bless them if they're not faithful, and you're not faithful if you put up with um, dissent and uh, what they saw is heresy. And again, there is some irony here that those who want to be free are denying freedom to others. And 
Um, religious dissent in Massachusetts, the two people that the AP really wants you to know are Roger Williams, who is a proponent of the separation of church and state, which is anathema to the Puritans. And he's going to be tossed out and he's going to found Providence, Rhode Island. He also believes in fair treatment of the Indians. And um, he's even challenging the charter that the Massachusetts have to uh, really, you know, have their own colony. And that's kind of a, uh, it's an interesting thought of Roger Williams that you're basically accepting the right of the state to give you the right to worship. And he doesn't believe the state should ha have that say. And he's, he's kind of, you know, provoking a sleeping dog here. Um, you know, the English are letting the Massachusetts uh, dissidents, um, you know, worship freely in America. And who's this guy who's, you know, say, saying that they, the Indians have to be paid, the Brits don't have the right to give them the right to, uh, um, you know, have their government in Massachusetts. And he's challenging, you know, this whole society that's based upon faithful uh, fidelity to to the scriptures. And Hutchinson, remember her scandal is she's a female preacher and she is saying that we are not bound by the law. And the big fancy theological name for this is antinomianism. She says the Holy Spirit resides in us. God's God's law is in our hearts and we need to follow the Holy Spirit. And you know she's challenging this whole idea of a, of a educational system and a legal system and a society based upon the Holy Scriptures. So she's bounced out too, and she going, ends up going to Rhode Island. The triangular trade, again, is this trade, and to sort of think of conceptually, I don't know if the AP might give you a map where, you know, the uh, the trade is not going specifically to, you know, maybe the, the triangle goes up to uh, Europe, and then to Africa, and then to the Caribbean, and then to uh, Massachusetts, but it's this idea of transatlantic trade, this dependence on trade, sort of looking eastward, looking to to Africa, looking to um, to Europe to trade. Mercantilism is this notion that the colonies exist to sell raw resources, natural resources, to England, which are transformed, which are finished into trade goods to sell back to the colonies. There's this idea of a hermetically sealed system where money doesn't leak out. You're not having selling, you know, buying and having your gold and silver going to purchase from the French, the Dutch, or the um, or the Spanish. And you know, you had these these goods uh, which you know you're supposed to buy hats made from England. You're supposed to buy iron made from England. You're not supposed to be doing uh, you know fashioning raw goods into manufactured products. And of course, the colonies are breaking these rules. They're trading with Africa. They're trading with uh, the Caribbean. You know, the Caribbean is a you know ready place to sell food to, to for all these slaves who are working there. And that's going to become an issue at the end of the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War, a few things to know about this war, which is sort of our transition into the next unit on the revolution. It's fought over what's called the Ohio River Valley. This sort of think of western Pennsylvania. The French are moving south and the British are moving west. And there conflict, there's a conflict over who, who controls this territory. And the war is fought between the English and the French, and most of the Indians are taking the side of the French because there's less of them. The Indians aren't aren't stupid. They're seeing that there's a vastly huge, uh, huger number, more huge, huge, larger number of English than there are French. And the French will lose, and the Indians will be, you know, be losers also in this war because, because of their alliances. The French lose Canada, and they lose all the land east of the Mississippi River. England will end up in debt and England will end up raising taxes on the colonies and they're going to begin trying to enforce mercantilism, which has sort of been ignored here for, um, for over a century. And remember these navigation acts, which were enforcing mercantilism, saying you have to trade with England on English ships. And the colonists haven't been doing this. And there's going to be the end of this period of salutary neglect. Remember, salutary means healthy, neglect means uh, you know, basically ignoring the mercantilist rules and the navigation acts that enforce them. And the colonists who have been giving lip service of, um, you know, faithfulness to the king and to, uh, to the parliament, um, but doing their own thing, worshiping how they want, making their own laws, trading with whom they want. Remember, the colonies here are essentially independent, but they're getting all the benefits of being protected by the British army and having this huge market in England to sell to. So uh, this will become a problem when the English are going to start tax enforcing taxes to pay off the war debt that the Brits have run up here in the French and Indian War. So there's some thoughts on the review sheet. Do look over your notes. Do look. I put the powerpoints up on on Moodle, and um, you know just uh, 
study hard, study early, and make sure you know what's on the review sheet because this all reflects something that in some way is on the test. So see you soon.